So with that in mind, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, pass over to uh, Brett for the first talk. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good morning. And we're going to talk about uh, indications for surgery, uh, extent, and order of fixation. And so we'll go through a couple of cases that I want you to think about while we're moving through the, the information. So this is a 32-year-old who was in a motor vehicle crash, had a right-sided pneumothorax and rib fractures. And these are her plain radiographs. And just to have an obturator oblique view because of the uh, uh, pubic root fracture. Here's her CT, axial CT scan. And here's the second case. So this is a 19 year old who's uh, six weeks pregnant, uh, status post motor vehicle crash and had a, had a left sided pneumothorax with some rib fracture. So slightly different injury patterns you can see here on our plain radiographs. And this is her CT scan axial cuts. And so think about what you'd wanna do with both of those cases as we go through this. Uh, so my learning objectives are to list the indications for operative management of pelvic ring injuries, recognize when to use anterior and or posterior fixation strategies, and then determine the order of fixation because it does uh, matter, obviously. And so these are historical indications for operative management, which basically comes down to having an unstable pelvic ring injury. So if they're hemodynamically unstable, and the pelvis is the source of bleeding, open fractures, uh, some rotationally unstable injuries, vertically unstable, uh, combination pattern, historically posterior ring displacement greater than 10 millimeters, pubic symphyseal diastasis greater than 20 or 2.5 centimeters, rami fracture displacement at least 1.5 centimeters, associated acetabular fractures, and then polytraumas are excuse to do uh, everything always. Um, and potentially your skill is also one of the indications as far as, you know, do you take care of it or do you send it to somebody who's uh, more experienced at it? And so what does displacement mean? Uh, and this is a slide uh, from Tanya Ferguson. You can see that you can get distracted with this central acetabular fracture dislocation on the left, uh, but there's a lot of displacement in the uh, pelvic ring. And so the long-term effects of displacement and malunion in the pelvis is not really well, um, borne out in at least prospective data. Um, future problems can be leg link discrepancy, sitting in balance, chronic pain, and difficulties with um, having a baby or pregnancy, depending on the size of the child. Um, and this is uh, basically a, a paper by uh, Kelly uh, et al, Kelly Lefebvre et al, who looked at what outcomes are important uh, for using pelvic ring functional outcome scores. And they looked at the kind of the most prominent three ones that are out there, including the Majid score, and none really correlated. Uh, there was the Iowa score as well as the Orlando score. There was no mental or emotional component because they also compared to the um, musculoskeletal functional assessment, the short form, uh, and the S SFA. Uh, and they concluded that really something better was needed to kind of incorporate the, the mental and emotional uh, problems with having a pelvic ring injury because they are life-changing injuries. And so how do we measure displacement? Plain films, it can be difficult to see posterior ring displacement, as you can see here on this right-sided sacral fracture. Uh, CT scans are obviously helpful, as you can see, that's the same patient um, that you can see that's better visualization about the fracture pattern as well as displacement. And then this is a different patient, but you can see that the surface rendered uh, 3D reconstructions and 2D reconstructions that you get can be helpful. So this is another paper by a similar group from Vancouver that looked at three common ways of measuring pelvic displacement that's been reported in the literature. And uh, this is actually one that they uh, came up with called the absolute displacement method. It does require a lot of measurements, six measurements on three of the plane films and AP inlet and outlet views. And then the last one uh, for displacement was the inlet and outlet ratio measurement that uh, Cloud Saji described. They also looked at the reduction uh, 
uh, evaluation that Mata and Tornetta um, published. And their conclusion from that was that pelvic displacement measurements were not, have not been validated. There was a lot of inter-observer agreement that was poor for all methods, and they didn't really look at intra-observer uh, correlation. They did conclude that the SAGI method was reliable for wide displacement only. And so operative indications, this is obviously a no-brainer. I mean, there's nobody, uh, at least I don't think there would be anybody that would treat this non-operatively. So what about this one? This one, it's even hard to see on the plane films where the potential injury is, but she does have a, a small right-sided sacral fracture that's really not displaced. And I'll try, this is unfortunately went very fast, so I'll try to slow it down here. And you can see that she has a zone one fracture that does uh, get close to the frame in there. And then, uh, so non-operative management can be used for complete or incomplete sacral fractures with minimal comminution, minimal displacement, and, and really in this one, there was no anterior ring displacement. And so this is what her post-mobilization films look like, and there really was no change. Uh, so she was successfully treated non-operatively. But there's, there's gray areas, and that's usually in an LC1 pattern. And so uh, Kelly Lefebvre and, and et al. looked at, you know, what exactly constitutes uh, a LC1 type fracture. And there's a lot of variation in what that injury pattern looks like. Uh, and then there's also more prospective studies that uh, Tornetta's group published that looked at, particularly looking at uh, LC1 injuries. And Dr. Rout was on uh, one of these papers, at least as well, a large group of folks that take care of pelvis fractures. And so, you know, does fixing an LC1 really help with pain management or are there really clear indications? Uh, and there, the conclusion of that paper was that there wasn't. So this is a minimally displaced LC1 with a complete sacral fracture. This is the uh, CT scan showing that the sacrum does have some anterior comminution. And then what about those with anterior ring displacement and comminution? So the benefits of non-operative management is obviously avoid the risk of surgery. Um, the potential risk, there is a potential risk of late displacement, which can make the surgery more difficult depending on how much displacement you have. Um, the benefits of operative, you know, we talked about polytrauma as being one of those indications for, you know, maybe that lets you weight bear them early on that extremity or that allows them to weight bear when they wouldn't otherwise be able to if that's the way you're treating that specific patient. You know, does it improve pain? Um, is it easier for them to get around? You potentially avoid late displacement or decrease that risk. Um, you do have the risk of surgery and you do have the risk of hardware failure and further surgery. If screws back out or, or plates break, that sort of thing. So what about exam uh, under anesthesia? X-rays and CT scans are static images. It's been shown to be effective for acetabular fracture management. So this is a paper that Dr. Saji published on uh, one of the techniques of doing it. So these are different uh, stress exam techniques that the figures are showing here. And this is their paper. They looked at 68 pelvis fractures. They had 14 that were quote unquote uh, classified as an APC1. When they went to the OR and examined them, they actually uh, had 50% of them become APC2s that went on to fixation. And this is a patient that I was concerned that had potential, it was a, a qualified as an APC1, but I thought it would be beneficial to uh, do an examination under anesthesia. Um, they also looked at uh, 23 APC2s and 57% of those, they reclassified as 2As and 2Bs. And then they actually had uh, only one of them that they reclassified as an APC1. So this, this particular patient of mine was stable. They didn't open up posteriorly and the symphysis didn't go beyond uh, basically two centimeters. So then they looked at LC1s, there were 19 of those and 37% of them uh, were positive for stress exam and uh, went on to, they classified them as a LC1B and went on to surgery. Uh, eight of them were LC2s that were 63% were unstable. And then they actually had four LC3s, which um, I'm not sure many of us would do just a plan on just a stress exam, but 100% um, of them were unstable, which would be expected based on the fracture pattern. So this is the APC stress view for that patient. 
and the front and the back uh, imaging showing that stress. So this is another one um, from um, multiple authors at different facilities looking at the benefits of a negative stress exam uh, as regarding with regards to union without further displacement. So this was retrospective that was a relatively small number of patients, 34 that they had LC1, 2 and then APC1 patterns um, and there was no significant difference for displacement at final follow-up and all fractures uh, united. So let's move on to uh, operative techniques. Uh, we're gonna get more detail from uh, these fine young gentlemen. Uh, James is gonna talk about the anterior ring. Connor's gonna talk about SI dislocations and fracture dislocation. And then Ray, uh, Ray is gonna talk about sacral fractures in general. So the goals of reduction, uh, I think we all try to strive for anatomical reduction, but what is an acceptable malreduction? Um, definitely the joints, so SI joints, if you don't get it reduced, it increases your failure rate significantly. You know, is it key to get the ramis perfect? Um, you know, do we try to aim for less than five millimeters? Um, symphysis, if you don't get it right, um, a poor reduction goes on to failure. And the joints are the most difficult, especially correcting for vertical displacement and flexion, uh, flexion and extension deformity. So anterior only or anterior than posterior. So these are the injuries that I think of that you can go anterior only or anterior than posterior. So APC2 injury where the still the hinge is intact posteriorly with the posterior ligaments. Um, and these are purely rotational injuries. And so this is uh, a CT scan of that patient with a binder on. And you can see that at least the left side of SI joint is open in the front. And so it went on to heal with uh, just a plating in the front. Uh, sometimes, depending on if there's uh, a flexion or extension deformity to the hemipelvis, uh, I would add a uh, sacroiliac screw like you see here. And so there was a published paper on this um, out of Tampa and, uh, and uh, Vanderbilt. They looked at uh, 42 anterior only platings and then 92 combined. And there was a significant difference uh, and failure rates with those that were treated with anterior fixation only for both uh, fixation failure and malunion. And so, uh, you know, I think in, if there's any question, I think adding posterior fixation is beneficial. So how about posterior then anterior? Um, I think of that when posterior fractures are involved or SI joint displacement, including vertical displacement. So rotational and vertically unstable fractures. So this is a 22 year old motor vehicle uh, crash, it was car versus truck, and they had a positive fast exam and they were hemodynamically unstable. Uh, so what did Dr. Krieger tell us? If you could please um, mute your mic, thanks. Um, so do we fix it? When do we fix it? You know, what do we do since they're hemodynamically unstable and what order of fixation? So this is uh, actually, Dr. Routes talked about a resuscitation screw, so this, uh, patient wasn't stable after they did the exploratory laparotomy and the splenectomy. And so we went in and did um, an anterior uh, X fix and then a posterior SI screw on the right side. And this is his post um, post op uh, CT scan uh, on the right there. And so four days later, went back for definitive fixation of the, re the remainder of his injuries, including a femur fracture. And so it is important to avoid residual displacement because it can affect your ability to safely put hardware in. So one of our chairs, Dr. Riley, uh, published this paper several years ago where they looked at six uh, cadaveric pelvises and they looked at uh, safe iliosacral screw placement based on the amount of displacement through the sacrum. So this is the diagram showing what the in intact sacrum corridor looked like and they varied the displacement between five and 20 millimeters. And so this is at 10 millimeters and greater than 10 millimeters, there was shown to be an increased risk of unsafe placement for the iliosacral screws or sacroiliac screws. So with one centimeter of displacement, 56% uh, of the placements would be compromised. And so now we can move to the uh, cases. So this is that 32-year-old with the right side of pneumothorax and rib fractures. So outlet and inlet views. Again, just showing the right-sided 
anterior ring injury. So here's her CT scan, which I thought she had a LC, minimally displaced LC2 fracture. And so what do you wanna do? And so this is where I think um, potentially uh, an examiner anesthesia may be helpful. So these are the options that I thought you definitely could have a trial of non-operative management and get post-mobilization films. Um, you could get an examiner anesthesia and go from there or just plan on uh, fixing it. And I chose number two. Uh, so this is without stress. This is with stress and it didn't significantly move, but I thought it moved enough to where I just had to do it. So put the LC2 screw in to create a stable hemipelvis and then connected that back to the uh, sacrum. And that's her imaging post-operatively. And she came back 22 months later and this is what her final images look like including flamingo views and showed no anterior instability. She did get a little HO on the left uh, abductors, uh, which um, didn't really make sense, but she may have been kind of, that may have been what's pinned, what was pinned under her with that mechanism of injury. So case number two, uh, this is a 19 year old who's six weeks pregnant, plain imaging. This is her CT scan. So I thought she had a lateral compression type three injury. And so how about order of fixation? Do you do the front first? Do you do the posterior first? Do you fix the left and right? Um, so these are some of the things that you need to think about. Uh, and so this is just, uh, they're gonna talk about different reduction methods, but this is what I use in this patient. It's percutaneous reduction. Uh, commercially available thing called a star frame, uh, which I found helpful in some situations. So the right hemi pelvis was anchored to the table uh, and then using the reduction pins for both uh, anterior posture control and uh, rotational control and flexion extension, uh, internally rotated their left hemi pelvis and added a ball spike and uh, put an SI screw first. And that's what it looked like with the anterior ring after the SI screw was placed. I like that reduction and had the left uh, anterior inferior iliac spine uh, LC2 type pin, so I couldn't put that screw first. So did a retrograde ramus screw on the left side and then took out the uh, chance pin and placed the LC2 screw. And then did a right SI screw, which her right SI joint wasn't necessarily that unstable, but I was concerned about her parasymphyseal injury on the right and thought that her uh, alignment was good. And because of her pregnancy, I didn't want to um, place hardware in the front um, uh, just because we'd be close to where the baby was, et cetera. And that may not, that may be faulty logic, but I wanted to support her anterior ring by fi com completely fixing the posterior ring because it would have required plating, I thought, in the front. I didn't think a ramus screw would be helpful. So th these are her post-operative images. Uh, and th this was done about six years ago. Today, I would have added a second uh, sacral corridor screw that was transiliac transsacral. This is at, at four months. She's weight variance tolerated. Uh, unfortunately, she lost the baby. Um, she's abulating without any assisted device. And so in summary, um, you know, the widely displaced pelvic ring injuries, those are easy ones to choose to fix, but the gray zone, the LC1 fractures um, may be difficult to decide sometimes. Uh, sometimes anterior and posterior ring fixation is needed. Uh, the order of fixation is based on the injury and it is important to avoid uh, residual displacement. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. <clears throat> um, Maybe one more tangent, maybe just uh, quickly, uh, uh, you could answer the question. So there, it came up a couple of people with the uh, radiation exposure during pregnancy for percutaneous fixation. Does that uh, kind of weigh the risk and benefits of that? Uh, it's def definitely a concern. Um, I think it 
matters a lot as far as uh, what stage of pregnancy it is. Um, but as far as the kind of the protocol that we have in conjunction with the general surgery folks is that early on, uh, definitely, um, you know, always the life of the mom is, is uh, prioritized. Um, and so it is more radiation. And unfortunately, you can't really place a lead apron underneath them or over the top of the abdomen. So just try to minimize exposure as much as possible. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. One other question uh, that has come up, and I know this will be somewhat addressed in the future, but uh, in a lateral compression pattern, um, what is the threshold for operative intervention in terms of internal rotation? How much internal rotation is acceptable for non-operative management and what triggers you to correct the deformity? Well, I definitely think uh, more than a centimeter uh, is definitely an indication for, unless it's a geriatric patient that, um, you know, is symptom is minimally uh, symptomatic and isn't a good surgical candidate, that would be somebody where you'd, I, at least I would accept more deformity, but anybody who's not uh, in the geriatric age group, low energy age group, uh, I would consider uh, more than a centimeter, definitely. And I think that's what the paper from Tornetta's group uh, talked about. It's like, we don't have a great, uh, I guess, agreement on what is considered something to operate on. And so that's, I think, a challenge to everyone who does pelvic fracture surgery that we need to come up with more prospective trials to come up with a better answer.